who gets skipped over when it comes to Black History Month. Um, and like there's so many folks who are looking um, who kind of like they should totally have movies based off of them that go. Like there's this one that comes to mind. He's the first African American captain in the U.S. Navy. And what happened is he and a group of other slaves uh, stole a Confederate battleship uh, during the Civil War and got the ship, got to the plantation, got all their families off, sailed it up to the north, released all the families, and then fought in like naval engagements against the Confederacy. And wow. Because of, like, it's just like, why is this not a movie, you know? And then, of course, there's Bass Reeves, who is a U.S. Marshal, who's actually half black, half Native American. And so for that reason, he made him serve as a U.S. Marshal. And, like, the dude was just, like, a freaking, like, there are, like, um, so what's his name? action movies that are more believable than, like, what he did like, in the game action movie. His name is Bass Reeves. Or was that serious? Like for instance, um, there are so many instances where like he would go and like catch a criminal, and he was totally outnumbered, and he just like beat down everybody, and like guns are blazing, and came out like unscathed. Like there was one story where he had been chasing down this one outlaw, and this gang caught him, they had him surrounded, and uh, the, this outlaw goes up to him and says, "All right, you got any last words?" And he says, "Yeah, I need to know what the date is." He says, well, why do you need to know the date is? So I know what date to put on your arrest record. And then grabs him by the throat, lifts him up in one hand, pulls his gun with the other, and points at the other guy and says, drop your gun. So he arrests them all. It's like, what? Dude's like a one-man army. What's that? This? Just no. coffee? No, what's that? <clears throat> That's tissues. No, what's that? That's a water bottle. No, no. It's a little plain. I know, I'm just being smart about it. Yeah, it's a little, ba it's a little biplane. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a thing for World War One aviation, so. I know. You notice what? Oh, that's no, no, no. I was talking about a specific time period. I was like, how would you know that? Because I'm driving my nonsense around. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, like, no, I, I knew you were driving because I know you have a bunch of random stuff. Yeah. I do have a lot of random stuff. You're, you're correct. Yeah. Did you make this? Yes. You made this? It was a kid. I mean, that wasn't really that hard. Yeah, it's like one of those little Lego kids. Like, put this to be a movie. It would be hard for us. But it's so yeah. good. There's nails. Just screw you, dog. Screw you, bolts. Anybody can screw a bolt. This is a thing. Yeah. Sorry, I was <laughs> That's okay. All right, let's get to this section, then we'll chit chat about a few other things. Let's talk about modern issues. There are three main topics hey, looking at today: health, conflicts, and economics. What you need? Paper. The no bell. Let's see who's out there. They got there. Right, right here. I like to do that to Miss uh, yeah. da Dalene, Dalene, how do you say her name? Miss Dalene. Yeah, Dalene, Dalene. No, she's her class, so I don't know. Okay. She, she, all, she speaks Spanish to me all the time, so I start speaking German back to her. Well, you know German? She's like, what? No. You know German? It's a student. But... Do you know Arabic? No, a little bit of Arabic. I wouldn't say I'm fluent by any shape or form. Just the basics. Yeah. Arabic's really tricky to learn, but not based on any. Um, in, 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 in any language families we're associated with, like, you know, if you think about it, in the United States, you're exposed to Romance languages and Germanic languages, and not, you know, Aramaic languages. Like that's not me. That's me. <laughs> I'm sure it's nothing. So we're going to write something about all these? Yes, indeed. This is the, the titles that we're going to go from. But basically, I'm summarizing what are the issues that we're going to be dealing with. And number one is health. Okay. So, what are the health issues that we have to deal with in Africa? Well, number one is HIV AIDS. What was the last one? Hmm? What was the last one? Um, Econo. Um, Dr. Sin. So, again, we kind of talked about this a little bit the other day, but what, you, what is HIV and AIDS? What's the difference? Like, well, what do we mean? It's a disease, clearly, but you guys know what the words mean? You can have one but not have the other. You can have HIV and not have AIDS. True. HIV is a virus. The key 
human immunodeficiency virus. Basically, it's a virus that attacks your immune system. If you have enough of these virals in you, enough virus, enough of the virus in you, I should say, um, it will make your immune system stop working. So you, whenever you die of AIDS, it's not really AIDS killing you, it's whatever you get. Because if you think about it, we are constantly under attack by a variety of different bacteria and viruses, and your immune system usually just handles them. But if you don't have an immune system, oh man, it's it's really hard to just survive, just to walk outside, you know? So one of the tricks that we have for helping treat this is using antiviral medicine, retrovirals. The problem is those medicines are expensive. Um, some cases, incredibly expensive. Um, I'm not sure what the cost is today. I know it's way less. But back when I was in college, the cost to most people was around $40,000 a year, which is more than most people make. So this begs the question, how do you even afford the medicine? The answer is donations and uh, insurance. Yes? What? That's what I found out yesterday. The smallest cells in your body? Well, not cells. I I guess I'm not really sure how this applies to what we're talking about either. Well, HIV AIDS kind of made me think of it. Okay, gotcha. Um, but in any case, back to it. So treating the symptoms, so to speak, you know, trying to kill off the viruses is pretty much the only way to go. However, that doesn't solve the problem. If we look at infection rates, <clears throat> It's most common throughout sub-Saharan Africa, because it's also the highest population concentration. And then you have percentage of the military HIV positive in 2003. So this is a ways away. This is in a, over a decade ago. But, I mean, shoot. I mean, look at some of these places. We're talking over 30% of the population is HIV positive. OK? A lot of this has to do with education. We know a lot about what causes the virus to spread. We know what makes people get the virus, but not everywhere they do, not everywhere they did. Information such as, you know, not, not having sex or uh, using safe sex practices to prevent the spread of the virus was unknown. And there's a lot of rumors about what might cure the virus, even though there is no cure. Um, for instance, in some places it was believed if you had sex with a virgin, it would just magically cure you which all that really does is spread the virus. So you have this as a major problem. The thing that we also have to understand, though, is Africa is by no means the only place that we have high numbers of infection rates. Um, you can see this graph. Let me turn it down to white so you can really see a bit better. You can see the highest concentration is in the southern tip of Africa, but we also have a significant presence in Southeast Asia, in Russia, and parts of South America. So this is a problem in many different places. Now the effect, and I told you I was going to get to this here in a second, is on the population. This, of course, is the population pyramid. I went over this with you guys when we did the study guide the other day. But uh, just to kind of remind you, the way you read this is in the center we have age groups. Then we have the different places and the different genders. Now, one thing you'll notice very quickly is it is really uneven in Western Africa compared to Western Europe. Okay, the reason for that. Um, population spikes are not uncommon. For instance, in the United States after World War II, when there was a significant number of children being born, it caused a population spike because of baby boomers. Since then, there's been fewer children born, and so things have kind of balanced out. But for most developed nations, you're going to see more or less a balance. <clears throat> this is called a neutral rate of natural increase. You don't have to worry about that. What that means. But essentially, what it means is that about the same amount of kids are being born as they're dying of old age. So it's basically a cylinder. This looks like an actual pyramid, and the reason for that is the adults are dying off due to HIV AIDS. Those who are of reproduction age are dying to the disease. 
leaving a significant number of children, many of whom are HIV positive, to survive, usually off of the very, very old, which is a problem. Because in traditional agricultural society, the reason you have big families is to provide sort of a form of social security. You know, whenever you get too old to work, your kids take care of you, you know, for whatever way. You know, um, <clears throat> that's not possible anymore. So one of the major problems with the economy as well in all these areas is there's just not simply enough uh, high aged workers in this region. So if we look at another bar graph, instances of HIV in South Africa, this is a little bit more wide than 2008. Uh, you see a negative correlation. You guys don't want to say negative correlation. You guys know what a correlation is? Okay. Yeah. In math, it's a, like a negative slope, right? Well, correlation has to do when one thing happens, something else happens. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, there was a correlation between the amount of fatty foods in a school and the amount of obese kids. Does that make sense? So, the higher the amount of fatty foods, the higher amount of obesity. So, we also have a negative correlation where one thing happens and then something else goes the other direction. So, the more of something there is, the less of something else is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, in this case, the more people using condoms, the lower the rates of infection. So what's happened is education is the way to combat HIV AIDS. Because as long as you keep the disease from spreading, you're not going to have as many rates of infection. Hypothetically, it could die off. In fact, this is what happens to a lot of diseases whenever you start introducing vaccinations, mandatory vaccinations. For instance, smallpox. You have the smallpox, this big nasty disease that was the number one killer in the world. Is effectively eradicated, doesn't exist. Except there are some individuals who became afraid of vaccinations because essentially some doctor lied and said that it causes autism, which later it was proven it doesn't, and he actually lost his medical license and found out that he was basically being paid by a group of people not wanting vaccinations. So essentially he was paid to lie. So there's that. And so what's happened is some outbreaks of smallpox have come back. So this disease is coming back because people were afraid of this thing. Does that make sense? So education about the causes and how to prevent it are having an effect. It's becoming less and less prevalent. One of the first things is letting people know that AIDS has no cure. There's no magic cure out there that's going to make you not have it. You're stuck with it forever. And the thing is, it's a particularly aggressive virus, meaning that, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys have had antibacteria at some point, or um, an antibacteria, like, um, what's the medicine that you want here? An antibiotic yeah. at some point. Um, and you'll notice, like, on the instructions, it says you have to take all of it. You know, you, you can't just stop when you feel better. You have to take all of it so that you're guaranteed you've gotten rid of whatever's in you and you're healthy. <clears throat> Otherwise, you end up with bacteria that are resistant to the drugs, and that's bad. You don't want that. It's the same sort of thing. With HIV AIDS, you have to take your medicine constantly, not missing a single pill, or else suddenly the virus could mutate and that drug won't work for you anymore. So it is something you have to have incredible discipline with and understand how it works, and that's education. Understanding how to prevent its spread, you know. One of the biggest problems with diseases like HIV AIDS is the fear that they install, the fear that you're going to be subhuman. Let me tell you from personal experience, it's very weird. Whenever I was at U of L, I actually took a course on human sexuality. And one of the things that we did is we would meet people um, in different experiences and things like that. And one of them was a guy who was HIV positive, um, who you know, told us his life story and how he had got the disease and all this kind of stuff. And um, one of the things I noticed, first of all, because he's very, very, very careful. Like, um, every single time there was a guest speaker, the professor would provide him like a, a drink and, you know, something like that. He wouldn't, like, most of us just open the drink and start drinking. He didn't do that. He opened the drink very carefully and then he got a straw from his pocket and drank it with the straw, and then when he was done, took the straw, folded it, put it in a plastic bag in his pocket, and disposed of it later. 
because you didn't want to expose anybody to saliva, which you could hypothetically, granted, that's a very low chance, but you can just hypothetically spread the disease. Be very careful. The other thing was, the desks were arranged like this, kind of, where everyone would sit and listen and speak. Whenever he came in, the front desk like shot way back to the back of the room. Like, there was just a bubble around it. No one wanted to be close to it. And we all knew what caused the disease. You couldn't get it from the air or anything like that. But it's still that fear of the disease, right? So a lot of people, when they become exposed to it, don't get tested because they don't want the confirmation, yes, you have it. So just a simple message, get tested, no, for sure, one way or the other, is a big part of it. <coughs> so, moving on. Another issue is waterborne illnesses. Uh, there are a lot of these. Do you guys know what percentage of the world is water? Including salt water, everything. Yeah. Spot on. Good for works. And uh, what percentage of that is fresh water? Less than 10. It's less than 10. We don't know No, I'm saying it's less than 10. Five. Are you saying you know it for a fact, or no. to say the, th the, the thing I've always heard is less than ten percent? Like that's we don't know for sure. It's somewhere around. Right. We don't know the exact number. Oh, I'm okay. Right. I'm sorry. That's all right. It's okay. It's fine. Um, so that percentage, right? That's just the fresh water. It's not salt water, right? Imagine trying to guess what percentage of that would be safe to drink. Just go up to and take a drink out of it. I don't even know. Like, I can't imagine. It's like, you know, the thing I always tell folks like, imagine when they just take a drink out of the Ohio River. It's like, but that's where all the water comes from. Yes? But what do we do to it? Purify it. Right? We, we treat it to remove all this stuff. Africa, a lot of places they do have that. Some places, not so much. That, what she's drinking, is water. Money filled Even with water. God knows what else. And this actually brings us to one of the major problems throughout the underdog portions of the world. Let's talk toilets. Okay? It's something we take for granted. It's an important part of our everyday life. Everybody goes poop. Everybody goes to the bathroom. And we know that that is going to be taken away somewhere else to treat the process and essentially maintain safe. One of the biggest problems and one of the tools that the World Health Organization uses to measure development is the number of toilets per person in a country, which seems like a really weird statistic. But think about this. If you don't have a toilet, where do you go to the bathroom? Oh, river. Wherever you find. Yeah, it's like a river. Like, it's kind of like a river, river where people get their drinking water, which spreads diseases like cholera and uh, some other pretty terrible things. So, getting access to clean water is a major problem for the lesser developed places in Africa. So, ideally, we'd see something like this. You know, and look at the difference in the water quality, yeah? The problem, though, is the technology for something like this is just really hard to maintain. I mean, it takes experts in the field maintaining equipment, and what's happened is, um, different aid organizations have donated technology like just these places and then they use it until it breaks down and then they're back to drinking really terrible nasty water again. So the infrastructure, the stuff necessary for this stuff to work isn't there in a lot of these places. So there's been some kind of ingenious designs to try to fix this problem. One of the more interesting ones is Life Straw. You can actually donate these things uh, on a couple different websites in various places. But here, it, it's really cool. This is how it works. So on one end, you've got sort of this open tube, this grate. And as you suck the water through the straw, it filters it. So when it gets to your mouth, it's perfectly clean. One of these will last, I think it's 24 hours to 36 hours, something like that. And I think it costs about 50 cents to make it, to, 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 to send it. Uh, they're probably way cheaper to actually make. The thing that's interesting is that they're really stupid easy to use. Open it up, drink out of it, 
Bob Jerkle works. It's really a cool bit of technology trying to aim at solving these problems, particularly in the very rural areas. Yes. Is it only until one? No. It's being used for that entire period of time. No, no, we use it after <coughs> After 24 hours, 36 hours? No. You got thrown away. But like, say for instance, like you're you're walking around, you're getting thirsty, you take out your last dog and a drink, you put it back in your pocket and you have a drink later that evening. Just so long as you don't use it past its use time. So it's pretty neat. I think it's really interesting too to also think about how, you know, in our own society, how much stress we put on drinking clean water, like how many people spend money on like EVN and all these water and things like that when it's just tap water. Literally these companies just open up a tap just like you do. And how much people spend money on like, you know, filters like Brita and Cure and all these different things. Yet we have at our disposal at any given time fresh, clean, easy, ready to drink water. Except we don't always. Have you guys been following what's happened in Flint, Michigan? Basically, basically in a nutshell, uh, their water's polluted and there's been incredibly high amounts of lead and their water which causes birth defects and all kinds of other problems. Hmm? Yeah. But this is what I'm talking about here is like we have the infrastructure unless we don't take care of it, stops working, etc. You know, this is <coughs> one of those technology things that we have, we what take for granted until we don't have it. Basically a company is dumping chemicals in the water. Oh. Long story short. The thing is they're not allowed to do it, they do it anyways. The problem is the fee that they're charged for doing it is less than it would cost them to do it right. And they're companies. Companies are not moral or immoral things. They're companies. They're there to make money. And so they look at something like, it costs me X amount of dollars to do this, X amount of dollars to do this, do whatever's cheaper, even if that means polluting and paying a fine. People sometimes forget to realize that corporations aren't people. They don't have a moral compass to follow. Now, they're led by people who might have a moral compass, but you know, that's not what a company's job is to do. So, you know, people have to sort of not let that happen, if that makes any sense. All right, so next issue is conflicts. Number one is civil war. Um, let's take, for instance, uh, this map. There's a lot going on this map. So let's have a look at the grid, shall we? Or the, um, the, the PM, you say. First up, we have state-based content conflicts in the gray. So all the different gray uh, nations here have all fought wars with other nations. So this is nations fighting other nations. These are wars that we think about. The um, little machine gun, those are non-state armed conflicts. So this is not within a state. This is between various peoples. So in other words, civil war. War within nations. Or war between peoples. And then the skulls are episodes of one-sided violence. Do you guys know what a holocaust is? It's not the holocaust. That was one event, a holocaust. What is it? Isn't it like a massacre or something like that? Sort of. It kind of ties into the word ethnic cleansing. It's the attempted extermination of a group oh. of people. Right? So think about what this means. We want this, we hate this other group so much that we just want to kill them all, like wipe them off the face of the earth. The only time I've heard people refer to stuff like that in the United States is like insects, like specifically like mosquitoes. Because no one likes mosquitoes. <laughs> but think about that. That's the mentality that people have about another group of people, is the world would just be a much better place if they were all dead. Right? And here's the thing is, we get all bent out of shape about Holocaust. We talk about it. It's a major topic in, in world history. It's a very important topic, don't get me wrong. But look at all these skulls. Each one of those is a Holocaust that's happened across the world, and we never talk about it. You know, people often talk about it from, from now. Right. It's, there's a little bit more emphasis put on it. I think one of the things that shocked people was the blood diamonds. You guys are familiar with those? Basically, it was uh, most diamonds in the world come from Africa, if you guys don't know. And um, 
what's happened is for a long time in the 90s, uh, almost all of the diamonds in the world, like 80% that were being mined, were being mined using slave labor, and they were being, these diamonds were being sold to buy weapons that were then used to fight these civil wars and often resulted in one-sided violence and extermination. The uh, treatment of these slaves was incredibly brutal. They would essentially go into villages and, um, you know, rape all the women there, kill all of the men, and press that they didn't kill into slavery and force a lot of children to fight as soldiers by drugging them up and having them execute their own family members. And just types of human cruelty is scarce to believe to be true. And this is all going into fueling the diamond industry, which we associate with love. That just is all kinds of messed up, if you think about it. And so this kind of brought a lot of attention to the area because people were so disgusted with what they it had veritably been, you know, participating in. Because, you know, most people they go buy a diamond ring, they're not thinking, well, I hope this diamond isn't the result of human suffering. They're thinking, gee, I'm gonna buy a ring for my sweetheart, what friend should I buy? And well, yes, I would like a well, thank you, man, from you know the Shane Company. And I'm like, seriously, that's Shane Company's brilliant. They're gonna run into some things. We're back to Africa. Um, this is one of these issues that, what's the solution? And the answer is economics. Because here's the problem. Why do people engage in this kind of violence? Generally speaking, it's because they have very little choice. They have very little, the word is agency, right? You guys have a large amount of agency where you live. What I mean by that is you don't have a lot of choice. You can pick and do whatever career, for the most part, you guys want. I mean, clearly, I want to be, a, you know, or independently wealthy. I want to just, you know, not work a day in my life and just be really rich. That would be fantastic. Most of us can't do that. But as far as other concerns, if you would say, like, I want to do this job, you probably can. You know, if you put forth the effort and have the opportunity, sure. You know, it's it's very possible. Most places you don't. You can't get an education because there isn't any, or if there is, it's very limited. And even if you get the education, it's not going to help you because there's no jobs. So what do you do for a living? You know, you're basically going to have starvation, and you're going to be really anxious, and then someone comes along and says, hey, it's these guys' fault. They're the ones who are causing no jobs. They're the ones who are doing this sort of thing. We're really angry. We should go do something about that. Everybody gets their guns and goes and destroys them, feels really good, and steal all their stuff, loot them for everything, all the money they have. Look, I'm rich now. This is amazing. I'm going to keep doing this. And suddenly we have a civil war with one side of violence on it. This is a very easy loop to get caught in that's caused by a lack of economic opportunity. And why that is, oh man, we go way back in history, but essentially it's imperialism. It's, it's essentially the Europeans that did that. So, you know, it's a major issue. <clears throat> this shows uh, armed conflicts in Sub Saharan Africa. And what's interesting, this actually compares it as to the climate. Because the other thing we have to understand is how this is affected by geography, the physical geography. Again, opportunity. Wherever you have opportunity, wherever you have wealth, wherever you have a chance to actually make a living, you don't have these things as much. But where there's conflict over scarce resources, oh man, that's where it goes down. As we said, child soldiers are a tremendous problem as well. Not so much because of the numbers, but because of how bad the conflicts are. I mean, essentially, you're talking about why are they going to check children? Why would they use adults? Because they're all dead, either to HIV or conflicts. So you go to the next generation of kids, and you raise them in hate. How are you supposed to stop this cycle of violence and hate if they're learning it from a young age? So these are problems, yes? And again, generally, the answer is economics. Why is that gun? What kind of gun is that? That is an AK-47. That is probably the most prolific machine gun on the face of the earth. They've been more produced. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're really easy to use. They are incredibly resistant to dirt and grime and gross things like that. They're horribly inaccurate. They're not really great weapons, but they are responsible for more, or rather, they've been present in more conflicts than pretty much any other weapon in history because they're maybe a spear. That's this part right here? That's the ammo. Yeah, that's called a magazine. Sometimes people call it a clip. 
Thanks for the free story bullets. We'll talk about Russia in particular. Why is it that all these Russian weapons are ending up places? But have you thought about I did. Eon on it. Yeah. I heard for you this one, man. I'll tell you. So, as I kept saying, what's the solution he's from? Economics, economics, economics. So, how do we pick the economics? What is it? What's that? What is economics? Economics is the study of resources. Now, basically, what that tends to come down to is money. How can we get everybody more money? Because ultimately, that's how you have success. Um, one of the things that will show is that. The more money that people have that are able to spend as a disposable, disposable income, the better off the nation is. Um, now that being said, how do we get there? It's a tricky situation. First off, many of these nations are what we call developing nations. Where it used to be uh, third world countries, that's really kind of not very nice. That's kind of insulting. It's better to say developing because that's also more descriptive. It's these are what they're going to. They're trying to develop. They're trying to get to a place where there's better income equality. So this map, yeah. I'm playing white. Oh yeah, I, I don't use white app. Um, this map shows the gross national income, the average amount of money someone makes in a year, uh, in Africa. And you notice that some places we have a decently high, you know, for the region, twelve thousand five hundred dollars a year, which. For us, think about this for a second. How much money are you guys using in your budget per month? $2,000 per month, yes? So the budget that you guys are planning on, that you're using right now that you're developing, is more money than people make in these areas in a year. The yellow areas, the four stations in Africa, make less than $630 a year. Yeah. That's as much as most of y'all's rent per month. How do you survive on income like this? Well, frankly, it's very hard. Many people are undernourished, which as a reminder, that means uh, eating less than 2,000 calories a day. That has long-term effects on a human body. Um, your, your skeleton won't grow properly. Your muscles don't grow properly. You have organ problems. You've got all kinds of issues that come from this, that stem from this lack of income. So let's get down to it. It's a problem. People don't have enough money to survive. How do we improve it? I, I, I give you one guess. What's the, what, what do you think is the thing I'm going to tell you that people really need to have in order to do better economically? What do they need to make more money? Jobs. Well, yes, but how are we going to get those? Education. Bingo, bango. we got to educate the folks, yeah? So this is the progress uh, plan developed by the World Bank in 2005-2006 for getting Africa into the developed stages. There's six goals. Have the percentage of people suffering from hunger. Achieve universal primary education. Eliminate gender disparity. Reduce by two-thirds under five mortality rates. Reduce maternal and maternal by three quarters. And halt the reverse of spread of tuberculosis. In essence, all of these problems are tied together. First off, how are you supposed to learn if you're starving? Yeah? So we're going to achieve this, yes? So the blue is the good number. We want to have that as high as possible. That's satisfactory. And non-satisfactory is harder. So of all the various countries uh, in Africa, what percentage are meeting this, having the percentage of suffering from hunger? Only 30%. So two-thirds are still starving as of 2006. Achieving universal primary education means everybody graduates grade school. We're not quite the 25, or not quite the 30%, we're not 25% graduate high school. Gender disparity, the fact that girls can go to school as well as boys and have opportunities like boys. We're the better on 40%. Reducing by two thirds is under five and higher. That means that we want to reduce the amount of children who die before they reach the age of five. That's pretty poor, we're around 20%. Five, reducing maternal mortality rates by three quarters. The percentage of women who die in childbirth. Let me tell you guys, having a baby is the most dangerous thing historically that women can do. In fact, we think that we're isolated from that because it's so ubiquitous. So you just have kids, no big deal. But let me tell you, I have a personal experience with being this close from death. 
that comes to it. My wife, whenever she had a thirst, uh, was trying to have a natural birth. Turns out she can't because of her bone structure. But the doctors didn't know that, and so she was in labor for 43 hours. In case you're wondering what the average is, the average is about six, it's 12. And during that time, she had to have a total of three epidurals, and I think a grand total of 18 to 20 boosters. Boosters, I mean say. That's where you, or bolsters, sorry. That's where you give them a higher dose of your drugs. So it didn't work. Basically, the pain medication stopped. And essentially what happened is they told us that those are in terms either we get a C-section done now, or she and possibly the baby will, or she and or the baby will die. So it's just called crash C-section. So there's really no decision there. Right. But the thing is, is that this technology <laughs> that made this happen and allowed it to survive it is relatively modern. So places like that, she'd be dead, I'd be a widower. This is the reality of the world of history, yes? All right, we'll finish that up tomorrow, and then we'll do review time. Take care, guys.